welcome to the podcast from the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy, where we will be talking with two uh, distinguished visitors um, as part of the series on inequality. Um, the first visitor is Craig McEwen, who is the um, Daniel B. Fairweather Professor of Sociology Emeritus from Bowdoin College. The other visitor is Bruce McEwen, the Alfred E. Mursky Professor of Neuroendocrinology from Rockefeller University. So Craig, let me ask you as a sociologist, what got you involved in research on uh, molecules like cortisol and brain regions like you know hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Um, what what are you, what is a nice sociologist like you doing in a field like neuroscience? Good question. As a sociologist, I grew up with the uh, skepticism about biology uh, and concern that. Uh, it seemed biologists like to be deterministic, genetic uh, determinism, uh, genes are all. Um, but in my uh, social activism with the United Way of Midcoast, Maine, I got involved in efforts on early childhood uh, uh, development, and through that began to learn more about uh, the biology of stress and its importance and came to understand that many, uh, that some biological qualities that shaped uh, human uh, trajectories were in fact socially shaped so that biology and sociology actually were complementary. And um, began to learn more, talk with Bruce about his work on stress, and uh, began to educate myself about the biology neuroscience of stress, and uh, forged a collaborative relationship late in career uh, with Bruce, and it's been a great pleasure to do that. Fantastic, and you were lucky to have an eminent a uh, neuroscientist right in the family. So Bruce, can you tell us a little more about how environmental forces like, um, well, inequality, um, uh, you know, harsh childhood conditions and so forth, shape uh, stress and the kinds of biological processes that Craig was mentioning? <clears throat> well, uh, let me start as, at the beginning of my career, in fact, my PhD was in a laboratory of people who really invented the field which we now call epigenetics. So when we talk about genetics and epigenetics, we're talking about in epigenetics the factors of experience that actually shape our brains and bodies with the limits provided by our genes. And that has affected, my, determined the direction of my career, and we have studied brain areas and their sensitivity, responsivity to stress hormones and sex hormones and, and really begun to see how the healthy adult brain is quite plastic and, and responsive to the environment. Um, and this was all sort of basic animal research, but <clears throat> in the um, 1980s I was uh, recruited by the late Elliot Steller, who was here at Penn, into a MacArthur network on, on uh, health and behavior, and that later became a network on socioeconomic status and health, and it broadened my perspectives into the realm of social sciences uh, beyond just the medical sciences, epidemiology, and made me aware that you need to take a broader view of, of, of in order to really understand these complicated problems. Um, and so that has led me then, uh, again, when uh, we have a house in uh, near uh, Brunswick in, in Maine, and Craig and I began to work together, as he said, with the local United Way, and even did a presentation together, and then began to talk about how we can 
blend our science and 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 reach out to the uh, sociology community. And one of one of the funny stories about our history was we wrote an article uh, that uh, we submitted to the American Journal of Sociology uh, on biology and and the social world. And it was rejected by be, without review, so the editor thought it was of no interest whatsoever. And then through um, <coughs> colleagues who were believed sociologists who did believe in biology, we got it uh, uh, approved and submitted for the uh, annual review of sociology. And that article now has sort of was the hallmark so far of our collaboration and is really the basis of what we're talking about today. Yeah, and it's a, a great introduction to the field of um, social inequality and stress physiology for, for anybody who's interested in learning more. It's the annual review of sociology, McEwen and McEwen. Um, so you had a bit of a cold uh, reception to your first attempt to bring biology together with the sociology of inequality. And I'm guessing that was partly based on some of the more um, kind of deterministic and pessimistic uh, views according to which, you know, genes, um, you know, which you can do nothing to um, change, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, sentence, you know, some of us to lives of, you know, difficulty, of poor health, of low cognitive uh, abilities, and so forth. And while others of us have, you know, nice genes that set us up uh, sitting pretty, um, can you just briefly explain how epigenetics is different from genetics and uh, why it's not so consistent with a deterministic and pessimistic view of the biology of inequality? <clears throat> sure. The, um, I mean, the people who have the same genes, say a pair of identical twins, um, turn out to be very similar in many respects, but depending on their um, environment, uh, they can turn out in quite a different way. There are some famous studies of this. At the level of their genes, one can see modifications not in the sequence of the DNA, the DNA remains the same, but in modifications of the DNA itself that are not necessarily irreversible that alter the way genes are expressed because it's the environment acting through hormones and other chemicals in the body that cause genes to be expressed at a particular time for good or bad. And so a pair of identical twins that is, say, has a risk factor for depression or cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's disease, there's still only a 40 to 50 percent likelihood that the other twin will actually develop the disease. So we by no means are determined by our genes, except in a few cases with a lethal genetic trait. And so we're really then focusing on, on how the world around us shapes our brains and our bodies, because the brain and the body communicate with each other in a, a back and forth way, uh, and, and really shape who we are. And that provides lots of opportunities then to make a difference, starting very early in life and throughout the life course of taking advantage of what we call windows of opportunity, because the healthy brain is a very plastic and responsive organ, even in elderly, that we can help to, you know, direct, redirect in a positive direction. That, uh, that gives hope, that view that science is uh, revealing. Um, Craig, how, how would you apply those concepts to, you know, sort of bread and butter sociology issues, um, inequality, um, uh, um, criminology, uh, whatever, you know, they're all, all of the kinds of problems, real important real world problems that sociologists study. And uh, uh, the central problem that we're here to address really is that of inequality. And we know that people have uh, 
unequal likelihood of experiencing a variety of adversities in life, uh, especially in childhood, early childhood, that uh, have effects through um, stress experienced uh, uh, on an ongoing basis and that that can influence the development of the brain in ways that affects both cognitive uh, performance and behavioral outcomes. Um, and those, in turn, have life-shaping effects uh, without a p intervention. And the, uh, the, the, I painted the negative picture, uh, but the positive picture, as Bruce suggests, is the brain is uh, uh, plastic and interventions, carefully designed interventions, uh, positive, supportive human relationships can either prevent or re uh, the, the adversity from having those negative effects or uh, can help people rewire, so to speak, in ways that achieve more positive outcomes. And there are a series of uh, interventions that one can imagine uh, and that are in practice that um, appear to do just that. In fact, Craig, you've pointed out that <clears throat> rather than emphasizing the relatively low percentage of people, albeit higher than you know, who've had adverse early childhood experiences, who experience diseases, disorders, there are a lot who don't. And so there are factors, that there's a human resilience, which we don't yet fully understand, that comes from the things you pointed out, like good family relationships, social support systems, and, and just the, 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 what seems to be the, the basic direction of a human being to, to, to move in a positive direction. And this is part of the issue of inequality, because some of those protective factors that may uh, uh, prevent individuals experiencing adversity from uh, having uh, some of the negative developmental effects, uh, are, those factors are themselves unequally distributed. So having positive, uh, strong, supportive communities and social relationships with adults uh, can protect against um, toxic stress and its uh, effects on brain and body. Um, but uh, we live in a society where those protective factors are not equally available, uh, just as the adversities are more common in some parts of society than others. And we can think about ways um, not only to intervene, to protect, or to rewire, but to diminish the adversities to begin with. Uh, among those adversities emphasized in the neuroscience research is poverty, um, uh, socioeconomic factors, um, but there are others. Racism clearly has effects uh, as well. And to the degree that we can intervene to diminish those effects, especially in early childhood, um, fewer people will exhibit some of the adverse problems that result. I mean, there's the Chicago Neighborhood Study, which looked at people in Chicago of relatively the same income and education level, those living in the projects and those living in areas where they had access to uh, religious institutions and social, right? and the, the incidence of crime uh, was much lower in those, uh, the, the, the non-project uh, environment, and, the, and overall health was much better. So it shows how social organizations can be protective, and then as Craig was talking about, the, the, thing, the individ, more individual things that, that, like, you know, the nurse family partnership and other programs that actually help a uh, family function more better. Very so important. let me, before we go to some of the 
very promising um, interventions that have shown maybe we can actually do something to improve things. Let me ask you to be a little more concrete about these adversities, what they are. Um, people talk about adversity, they talk about ACEs, um, that may be a, a buzz acronym that some people know um, or have heard but don't quite know what it means. Um, and then poverty, uh, which um, is also a form of adversity. Um, Craig, can you just kind of lay out what the different, the different kinds of adversity that can afflict somebody and uh, you know, imperil their chances for a, a healthy, happy life? Uh, there are many kinds of adversity, as, as we know. Um, the ACEs, the ACE, A-C-E stands for Adverse Childhood Experience, uh, and that acronym comes from a classic and important study done in the 90s and continuing today with um, uh, Kaiser Permanente patients in California uh, and examined 10 common in that largely middle-class white population, uh, 10 adversities, um, including uh, parental uh, uh, physical and psychological neglect, physical uh, sexual abuse, um, uh, disarray in the family due to uh, problems of alcohol or substance use, divorce, a child, a, a uh, parent uh, imprisoned, um, and the number of those adversities experienced in early childhood is uh, related in a stepwise way to the likelihood of adult uh, um, uh, illnesses um, and to behavioral uh, uh, health issues such as smoking and, and alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, so that uh, powerful study helped, uh, has, has been popularized and has helped to communicate the message that um, social circumstances of individuals have long-term effects on health, which is an important message. The limit of the study is that it did not uh, enumerate the whole range of adversities uh, experienced, and there's a whole line of neuroscience research that tends to use socioeconomic status and poverty as a measure of adversity. Uh, but we know that racism is adverse. Uh, we know that dislocation in uh, immigrant households is adverse. Uh, and uh, disasters uh, can be adverse. So there's a wide range of adverse experiences uh, and people respond to them differently. Um, some uh, experience them perhaps as traumatic, others not so. And uh, so adversity matters. Our understanding of adversity needs to be developed and particularized um, in order to help understand more clearly the mechanics, biological and psychological, that translate those experiences into uh, uh, biological uh, outcomes. And, uh, and we need to know better the protective factors that prevent that from uh, happening. Um, as Bruce said, many people experience adversity and manage it quite well, take it in stride. Others are more vulnerable, and that may be partly genetic. Well, living in a <clears throat> noisy, polluted, dangerous environment with lack of green space has impact on health both of families and of children and has a, a, an enormous impact on on what we're talking about. That's fascinating. I mean, so really, these are clear indications that the social environment 
impacts the biology of your body and brain. And, and Bruce, you've been working to reveal some of that biology, and I know I don't want to put any pressure on you, but I hope you can hurry up and you know solve <laughs> solve this problem. Uh, just kidding. Um, but um, can you sort of sketch out, maybe based on animal models of where you expose um, you know young animals to stressors and right. see how it impacts their brain, just to well, give us a taste? <clears throat> starting with what happens when you create a negative environment for a mother rat or mouse in raising their young, uh, making it more difficult for, for them to do the normal nursing in a consistent way. What happens is that uh, there is a restriction on later on on the ability of environmental cues to, to stimulate gene expression. In other words, the, the, the an animal has a much smaller repertoire of responses as a result of this. Uh, now, whether that is something that we can not reverse but alter later in life, we don't know that. But there are studies on the human brain showing especially the prefrontal cortex, which develops after birth, that when there is early adversity, there's almost a, an early aging effect in the, in the child that learns to cope with the, the adversity, but then may deprive the child of other opportunities for you know, creativity, whatever, whatever you want to call it, may deprive them of the things which a normal childhood, prolonged human childhood, should help them do. Again, we don't know if the, any of this can be uh, re redirected later on. But this is the idea that the brain is a dynamic organ, and on the positive sense, when we are physically active, for example, there are a set of nerve cells in the, the hippocampal formation that we study, in, which is our important, the brain area that's important for memory and, and also uh, mood. Uh, and exercise stimulates the formation of new neurons, uh, even in elderly uh, people and animals. And, and, and to do this, it actually requires hormones from the rest of the body. And if you block those hormones in an animal model, you don't stimulate neurogenesis, just showing how important. One of them is insulin, and uh, the brain can become insulin resistant and so diabetes is not just a, a disorder of the body. It's a disorder of the brain, and it deprives, again, it impairs cognitive function. It does all sorts of things and increases the risk for depression and for dementia later on. Now, one of the consequences of early life adversity uh, is our increased rates of diabetes, of depression, and later dementia. And, and there are you know, some people who are following this trajectory Early life adversity creates a situation where they're less likely to be able to live a healthy life, die earlier, and, and so on. So that's how, you know, the positive and the negative side of how the brain and the body communicate with each other. So, I mean, this really highlights the sense in which issues that might be viewed as, um, you know, social justice, equal opportunity, every child should have a park to play in, um, are, can be viewed as public health issues, you know, down the line, um, metabolic, psychiatric um, diseases will uh, show and, up. And given the burden that these place on society in terms of lost productivity, uh, the burden on health care, as I sometimes say, even if you don't care about people's welfare, it affects our economy and our ability to flourish as a, as a as a um, an, an economy. Yeah. So from economy. from social justice to public health to economics, right. maybe that'll ring the bell for some <laughs> policymakers. Um, let me just ask one question in closing. Could could you each tell me about one um, policy that has been enacted? Um, perhaps an intervention program, perhaps some other sort of policy um, that you think shows promise for um, sort of interrupting the negative effects of environment on lifelong health and brain function? 
this would be, at least in the United States, hypothetical. Uh, that is, um, uh, provision of uh, universal uh, high-quality daycare uh, for children uh, and uh, to enable families to have resources they don't have um, in, a, in a world in which parents are living stressful lives, um, sometimes doing shift work, trying to manage households um, that become rather chaotic, providing continuity with high quality uh, daycare, uh, presumably would have substantial effect just as, and we are experimenting with this, uh, preschool, um, universal preschool for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Uh, so that kind of intervention which provides supportive, caring adults who are available in a regular way, um, both to middle-income, high-income, and low-income families could, uh, in theory, and one hopes in practice, uh, diminish inequalities in outcomes. And the, <clears throat> I mentioned before, the nurse family partnership, uh, bringing a social worker into a home of an expectant family or a pregnant woman in the case of a single, potential single parent, providing them with social support, with education as to what to expect when this child arrives. And this already has, over almost 20 years, been shown to have profoundly beneficial effects on the outcome of the child and also of the family. Um, and so here's a, here's a, here's a, a program that, it's sort of like the early Head Start, but it's, it puts more emphasis not just on the kid in the daycare, but on also improving the family uh, operation. And by the same token, this program in Georgia called the Strong African Americans Families Program takes adolescents and their parents and has a, a, a relatively brief seven-week session. But the results of that have indicated that there's less diabetes in the kids and their brains are protected somewhat from some of the changes that occur with continued poverty and, and, uh, and racial discrimination and so on. So there are, even, even after the early childhood period, there, there's hope that we can, that can make difference in, in particularly vulnerable times when there's change occurring, we at adolescence or pregnancy or young adulthood going off to the first job and so on and so forth. We think of the plasticity of the brain as offering opportunities to make a difference. That is very, very fascinating and very encouraging. So I thank you both for sharing your research with the, the Mitchell Center podcast. Thank, thank you. you.